be doing a little talk on his Cosmic Force, Commodore Story, and all the new projects he will be up forth and upcoming. All right, I, I will use the microphone then, um, I don't need to shout, or, and um, I feel like this is, this is like a, a, a nice relaxed, laid back session, um, I didn't create 20 pages of A4 to read off, so it's, it's more as it comes, and um, I think, first of all, what I want to say, um, the experience that I've had um, with the Amiga, the, the Retro, the Commodore, um, dare I say even like Atari or Spectrum community, you know, has been fantastic over the years and, and I realise <clears throat> as time has gone on, the thing that's the most important, of course, the hardware, of course, the games, of course, um, everything that's happened and, and the, the people that created these machines, but the most important thing right, right now is, is you guys, you're right, and that's the one thing I want to say right from the beginning. And um, like without people like like myself and and, and you uh, being enthusiastic on, on keeping um, the nostalgia alive, the old computers alive, then we, we haven't really got anything, you know. But together we, we've got something really special. And um, what I want to do is just give you a little bit of background about myself because you, you might have seen a few projects that, that have happened over the years and you think like, you know, who is this guy? Like Stephen Fletcher and, and the one thing I can say is um, back in um, maybe 2016 or 2017 that's when I, my eyes started opening up to this things happening in the, in the, in the retro world is these events that are starting um, to happen and, and you know, let's not forget this this event. Like this never stopped, did it? This this kept going like right through from from the nineties, you know. And but then the, the retro world started getting more popular. Um, at, at the time, you know, my background is a computer programmer. I've been a computer programmer for I guess thirty five years, or how many years it is. Maybe longer if you can include the early days on, on the Vic Twenty, which I'm going to talk to you about. <clears throat> and now I just lost my train of thought, but, but what, I'm, what I'm saying is that these events um, like sprung up and so I started realising that there's something special going on. At the same time as being a, as a computer programmer, um, I've worked on a, a few sort of short films, like some of it like narrative and, and some of this was with my, my sons, that they're, they're quite creative. Um, one of them's 30 and the other one's 28 now, so you know, they, they, grow, they grow up fast. Um, but basically in 2017, I like, realised that I needed to create a document what's been going on um, in the world as far as computing is concerned, right? Because we're all of a certain, well, not all of us, like some of us are of a certain age that you remember a time when you didn't have a computer and now we all have a computer in a pocket which is is quite strange and, and I think that if you go so, sort of 100 years or 200 years in the future people are going to look back and they're going to look at this moment in time and they're going to say what kind of human beings were we that you know come from a background of not having a computer and, and, and suddenly the world we have the own computer then we have a computer in a pocket you know um, so this has been a big world changing event and we're here and we're in this moment in time, this little blip that when it happened, right? So it made me realise that actually these first own computers are even more important. So it's not just about keeping a box alive, it's about documenting this moment in time for future generations. And okay, you know, when I talk like this, it sounds quite epic and that. But we're we're all part of that. We're part of this transitional period uh, for for the human race. Now, is it making us better or worse? I don't know. You know, in, in general, better. Um, but let's see what happens in the future. But the one thing I do know is it's really good to look back 
and look back at the, uh, the machines we used to use. So my first computer was the uh, VIC-20, Commodore VIC-20. Right, I want to have a, a shout out now, like, shout out some of the first computers that you had. C64. Uh, a C64, yeah. Um, any advance on C64? Anybody Controversial in this audience is ZX Spectrum. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's all right, that's all right. You know, yeah, yeah, but you know, I, I was at school. Um, I had the choice between a ZX81 or a VIC-20, and it's like, no-brainer, right? VIC-20's got 3K. Um, it looks better, it's got a bet, you know, anyway. But that's <laughs> yeah. But in the, in, in the school ground, like, if you, if you were um, around at that time, you know, you had, you had the specky uh, people, and then you had the Commodore um, VIC-20 or whatever, you know, or 64, maybe, later on. Um, anybody else? First computer? C64. C64, right, so we've got a few C64 and, uh, and Spectrum. Which, that's all right, you found the light now, have you? No, <laughs> yeah. no I'm joking. I think, um, you know, and I, I think everything, is, any, everything is, is, is relevant, you know. So for me, and uh, tell me if I go on a bit, I, I just want to give a back, bit of background for me, because when I first, right, so the first documentary that, uh, that made in the retro scene was the Commodore story. And the, the Commodore story, just felt I'm, like I needed to document like where Commodore came from. Um, I'm going to jump forward a bit. I'm going to jump into it in a bit more detail later. But I've got to say, at the time, um, I hadn't used any Commodore machines for quite a while. And then <clears throat> I started having a bit of imposter syndrome. You know, I'm going around interviewing these famous people, these people that created Commodore. You know, like Leonard Trammell you know, Jack Trammell's son, and, and it's like... But the thing I realised is that I did have a background in Commodore, and I'll just tell you a little bit about it. So, um, so when I was 13 or 14, I got a, a VIC-20, and um, like for, for any kid at that point in time, you'd not even touched a computer. There wasn't a mouse for it, you know. The mouse at that point was possibly being invented somewhere in the background. Um, but you had the VIC-20, you could plug it into your TV, you know. Um, uh, if you could kick the rest of the family off the one TV that we had. And, uh, and you know, shortly after that, we, we bought a, another second hand TV so I could actually get some airtime on this computer and then um, started writing games for it, which it was just a natural progression. It was like, I've got this computer, I've got the instruction manual, and the instruction manual includes this language called BASIC. And so, uh, decided to program um, some games. So, so the games that um, are created, I, I give them like really good names. It was actually about like five or six games. Uh, one was called Bat Attack. One was called 3D Road Race. Um, one was called Maze Man. Uh, and then there were others that I, I even forget now because the cassettes that I saved them on are, are long gone, and the games are long gone. And it's like I, I don't. I don't know if anybody has still got a copy of them, but what I did, um, at the age of 14, I advertised in the local paper, and, um, and it was selling like games on cassette, and you know, I was copying them, and, um, and it took a while to copy, because you've got to do it all in real time, and that, you know, but, um, but we had people coming to our, to our house, you know, I'm, I'm from Lancashire, we had a two up, two down, we had the corridor going in at a blocked off part of, we were in the front room, me and my brother. I blocked off so nobody could see my brother's mess. And I had a little desk and I'm selling these, these games to people that I didn't know, you know, from the local newspaper. And I did that for a, a few weeks and I was, I was doing all right, you know, for a 14 year old. And, and then the newspaper rang us up because, um, you know, it wasn't that long previous that we'd, we'd got a telephone. I'm not that old, I'm only like 53, but, um, but we haven't had a telephone that long, but that's the way, you know, they got in touch and they said, are you a business? And I said, no, I said, I'm only 14. He said, but we think you're a business and you're advertising in our newspaper, the Lancashire Evening Telegraph, and you're advertising for a rate that is, is for just private listings, you know, like just for advertising a bike or something like that. And they said, um, we need to put the price up 
And they were putting it up by like five times more expensive or something crazy. And anyway, long story short, they put me out of business. And so I didn't really sell any more games apart to like my, my friends at school and, and, and that, you know. So, so that was my first experience programming. Um, and the VIC-20 um, like got me into that, that world. Um, I, I was in one of the first classes at school that had an actual computer class. We had um, some Commodore PET machines. Um, I remember one time doing a game where in, in the early days you could, um, you could type out um, games from magazines. Um, yeah, one thing I've got to say as well, I, I did write a game and I got it in uh, Computing Weekly, it was like Program of the Week, I got a full page. Um, and years later it's actually on some, um, some website where it's like an archive and somebody actually typed in the game like um, literally about five years ago and they created a, an image of the game and, it, and it's there to download and play, you know, it's called Adders and Ladders. And that was the first game that I created um, that got sort of published, as it were, you know. Um, but anyway, going forward, um, I, I, these are just little experiences that I remember. Um, like being in school, I, I liked the game Scramble, you know, you used to go sideways and, and blow things up and pick fuel up and all that kind of stuff. And one of the projects was to create um, a program that would work on the Commodore PET and it could be commercial, it could be like a word processor, it could be a game or something, anything you want. And that's for your, your coursework at school. And I found a little machine called Routine, and at that point in time there were little data statements and just numbers. But on my VIC-20, it made the screen scroll sideways. So I sat it on and thought, oh, I wonder if, if I type this in, in school, I wonder if it'll make the screen scroll sideways on the Commodore PET, and lo and behold it did, because it was using the, the same memory map for the screen. And, uh, you know, so they looked, they looked at school and thought, how did you do this? And, you know, I didn't let, I didn't really let them know that I got it out of the magazine, you know. But, um, but then, uh, you know, the, the passion continued. So, when I left school, um, I, I ended up working, doing, um, yeah, that's a bit, bit breezy. Yeah, when I left school I ended up uh, becoming an apprentice programmer and I was programming, and you'll be happy about this, I was programming in Z80 assembler language, which is of course the spectrum, you know. Um, and in the company I worked at, um, this is more like an history lesson, isn't it? Than, uh, you know, but I'll get to the point of, of everything else in, in the moment. But, um, but they sold this uh, monitoring system and it was to places like Coca-Cola and it would monitor how many bottles go down the plant. And when they sold the computer, because we actually programmed it on EEPROMs, uh, electronically programmable um, uh, memory, and when we sold the computer, it wasn't a computer we sold, it was actually a desk, and, and part of the desk where the drawers normally are, I had all these computer uh, boards in there. Um, from there, because I've done machine code, I ended up getting a job in this other company. This is where my first commercial involvement with Commodore happened. And the company I was working in, um, they did a lot of machine control, uh, yeah, control machinery. And um, some of the machinery controlled like carpet machines, right? So there was two types of carpet machines. There was a needle bar shifter. And a needle bit bar shifter, you'd have like different color yarn and you'd have different rows of, of needles. And it'd be like, right, go left twice, uh, right once. and the end result is you, you design a carpet. Um, the other machine was a, a pilot, you know, like a sculptured carpet, and this is very of the 80s, I guess, and of the 70s, so it's like shack pile carpet, but, but you could actually sculpture into it different designs. And we, we actually programmed the design system on the Commodore uh, 128. And so with the 128, I say we, I, I was responsible for creating the actual design part of the system. Um, we did do some 6502 machine code in there as well, but, but imagine, okay, so, so we're not using a 64, we're using a Commodore 128, and you can design, like it looked like a tile, and it would, the tile would repeat, and then this Commodore 128 would be connected to this really big carpet uh, manufacturing machine, and it would then communicate to the controller, and the controller would control the machine. So, yes, uh, Commodore was 
bless you, that the Commodore was a, was a, a commercial um, machine. Now, the Commodore, like PET, and, and, and the, the previous like big box powders, like they, they were they were designed primarily for business, and you know, so as as time went on with the um, the Commodore 64, everything that came later, it, it started gearing more towards games, you know, more more like the own computer use, you know. Um, but there I was anyway, like working in the company, programming the, the Commodore um, 1 to 8. Um, so when I started thinking about things like this, whilst I was away, like filming the Commodore story, I'm thinking, yeah, I do have some history, I do have some history. Um, so I, I shouldn't really have imposter syndrome. And then another thing that happened just later on, and I, I programmed in a few different companies, but um, I ended up, um, I didn't buy an Amiga. Um, I had this like little small electronics company for, for a short while. And uh, we worked with a company that made uh, dongles you remember, I mean, they don't exist that much these days, but you put a dongle into your computer and it would enable you to run software. And the deal was that we were to solder up 2,000 dongles, and for that, we would get an Amiga 500. And uh, anyway, we, we, we cracked on and we, we met the, the dongles and we got an Amiga 500. And I found the Amiga to be a wonderful machine. Um, now, I must explain, in between the Amiga 500 and, and the VIC-20, uh, the electronics little company that did, and we concentrated on making audio cables, um, yeah, like cables like this. <coughs> um, we did have a Commodore 64, but I used it as a, as a spreadsheet machine. We had a, a dot matrix printer. Um, we used it as a word processor. <coughs> Sorry, a word processor. And, and so I never used it for games, which is absolutely unbelievable, you know, because there were a lot of good games on there, but I never, I was too busy trying to do business, you know, and um, and, and anyway. So then, when um, using this for for a business, ended up getting the Amiga 500. And then a friend of mine, he was quite into electronics as well, and and um, we came up with this novel idea. We said, because I had a video grabber, and said, well, what if we could create some hardware? We could connect eight cameras, security cameras, to the Amiga. And then the Amiga would monitor uh, what we see in, in, in the vision of the camera for the eight, cam eight cameras. <clears throat> and then it would um, basically uh, track people going through scenes, um, you know, different rooms. Um, and also, one feature that we, we quite liked, and, and at the time it was in the, the mid 90s, this. Um, yeah, so what, what we, we ended up doing is designing a meat machine. Uh, a system called Sirius, and it connected to the uh, security cameras, and it could detect uh, parcels. Right, so if you're in like a shopping centre or or a, um, an airport, and somebody drops a case, it would work out the ultimate background, even with people walking in front, and it could spot that a device or or a box had been dropped uh, on the floor there. All right, I'll log in in a minute. <laughs> um, and, and this, this uh, system, it, it, it became interesting to some investors and um, they, they put a little bit of money uh, into it and we started doing a few uh, security shows. And I remember going to a show and, and we demonstrated the system. I think we had like, like uh, some Lego people or whatever with a camera just pointing. And, but the, the thing that was interesting is the, uh, the Commodore uh, Amiga, we had to have underneath the desk um, so we had a mouse there and a screen, but we, we weren't allowed to show the Amiga because everybody thought the Amiga was a games machine. So yeah, so when, so later when we actually uh, went into production, and, and we did go into production, and, and the system was put into um, two shopping centres in the UK, um, we had to like port it over to a, a DX266, um, you know, we had to port it over to PC, and I can say to this day the PC never worked as good as the Amiga did, in my opinion, but, you know, I might, I might be a bit biased on that one. Um, going forward, it, it was a success, but we had a disagreement with the people that put the money in, and, and, and so we only had a, a limited run on uh, what we did there, you know, but the point, the point is, it was the Amiga that, 
that we could prototype and actually create a fully working system. So this then, while I'm film, filming the Commodore story, I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, I, I've got a bit of history <laughs> with Commodore um, and, and Amiga. And, and we have done some stuff, you know, we had to do some machine code programming on there and, and, and et cetera, et cetera. So, but what I want to do uh, just now is I'm going to log back into my computer and, and I'm just going to play it like, just, what, what time are we up to? Because I've, what? Oh, I'm going to play this. That's all right. So I'm going to just, it's going to be half an hour altogether, so it's literally just another 10 minutes. But I'm just going to play the beginning bit. Um, yeah, I'll just play the beginning bit here. Um, and then I'm going to talk more about what we've been working on. created for creative types like me. It had a certain set of ideals in its design. The creators wanted people like me to take it and run with it and change the world. To some extent, it achieved that. But over the past 30 years, it's become more than just the computer, it's become the people using the computer. Today, the Amiga is the Amiga community. We have events like these all over the world. The community is expanding. There are more and more people getting interested in not just what it was, but what it can do today. And getting as much enjoyment, if not more, out of it now. And they were in the future when they ever did, back in the 80s. It's an amazing creation, and it's created an amazing thing that we all have and we all share together. And hopefully, this will continue on for many years to come. The end of Commodore is no longer a shock, and everyone who loves the Amiga has realized that we're all Amiga. It's just really nice to kind of see the whole scene growing. Who would have thought it would be expanding rather than reducing? It blows my mind that we're here in Germany, and the event with about a thousand people who come here to celebrate this machine that hasn't been on sale for almost 25 years. Even though the original half is dying, it's not going to be a documentation what the half is doing, because it does take the knowledge and put it into new IC, whether it's classical, next generation, uh, emulation, FPGA, it doesn't matter. The league is back in business. I hope that there are many more people again have this new idea in their hands and can participate and join the old thing that you get from here. What I'm hearing now is just like, what? That's coming out of that machine? It's quite unbelievable, but uh, yeah, it's exciting. So um, we, we did the Commodore story. The Commodore story actually took us like right across America, and, and the thing that was amazing. So I, I've talked enough about me. And let's talk about the people that um, that we interviewed. Um, so mainly, the the, the Commodore uh, was manufactured in, in America, and, and the people that were behind Commodore are, are mainly in America. Um, but we did interview quite a few people throughout Europe as well, and. So going over there, um, you know, um, I'll, I'll not go through through like the names of people, but um, mainly what we did, we, we we sat and listened to the stories of what people had done within Commodore, like for the manufacturing. So um, and listen in their their moments in time, 
like when they when they did things, when they worked in, in Commodore, who they worked with, what they created, what machines they created, um, what what it was like to actually be there at the time, you know, because we can only look back through through uh, through a window like this. Um, and my overall feeling was that Commodore was a bit like. Um, Maybe like Google might have been in the beginning, you know, it's like, right, there's a room, uh, chuck some developers in there, let's chuck pizza boxes in there, let's uh, put some um, comfortable cushions or whatever, and let's, let's make sure that there's room underneath the desk so they can sleep underneath the desk if they need to. And it was like, really that sort of like vibe, you know. Um, I'm not saying there were drugs involved, um, but there could have been if, they, if some of them were like quite young and crazy. And um, sometimes they needed to really like work 24 hours a day to, to meet the targets. And, and this, what, this is what came through when we interviewed the guys. And uh, of course they're all uh, you know, quite a little bit older than, than they were and, and, and they're quite, quite willing to tell us these stories. And then once we got all the footage back, we just sliced it up and, and let the people we interviewed actually tell the story of, of Commodore. Um, one very emotional experience I've got to say is when we were talking to Leonard and if you know uh, much about the Commodore story you'll know that uh, Jack Trammell actually came from Poland. Um, just recently we've, we've been to PIX11 um, in Poland and I think Commodore always has a, a special, Commodore and Amiga, there's a special place for, for these computers in Poland because of Jack uh, Trammell. And, um, so he, he survived things like Auschwitz and, and, and you know, he, he came from the ghettos, he travelled over and, and he got liberated and he ended up in America and he started a typewriter company and if you know the story, he ended up making it, the electronic watches and calculators and that moved on to, uh, to, to joining up with Chuck Pedal and, and becoming the, the computer company that we, we remember. But um, the one thing that was quite emotional with, with Leonard is when um, we started to talk, you know, we talked for a little bit and um, I didn't want to just jump straight into like, um, you know, did your father tell you much about the time when he got liberated and what it was like, you know, um, like coming from that background, but he, he actually talked about it in depth um, and it, it was an emotional time, but it just, to me, the, the thing that it, it, it gave me the most is when given the opportunity, um, what great things anybody can do, you know, and, and I'm talking about anybody here today, you know. So, so the reason for doing the documentary is to actually highlight stories like this, you know, that, that this guy came from the ghettos, started one of the biggest computer companies in the world. Um, and then, you know, and I'm, I'm going to just go forward. Um, so this was done in 2018, it came out and uh, it was a very enjoyable experience. We, we ended up making an interview um, release and because people started saying, well, you know, it's a two hour documentary, we want to see the full interviews. And so we, we put together like 16 hours of the interview. So, you know, if you want to listen to uh, Leonard Trammell, it's like one hour 42. Today's not an advertisement. It's just that, that there was an appetite there for people to hear more about what, what had happened. And then, just coming uh, like right, up, right up to date, um, in, in between starting Amiga 2020 that became Amiga Alive and Kicking, um, because I'd programmed on the Commodore, uh, the Commodore VIC-20, and I'd programmed on the Commodore 128, albeit carpet design machines, I wanted to carry on the game front. And so, I decided to, to create a, a Commodore 64 shoot 'em up game Cosmic Force. Now downstairs at half past three there's actually a Cosmic Force shoot 'em up competition and uh, you, you, the winner wins a game and they win a trophy, you know, so if you want to be part of that, that's, that's great. And um, it was just a challenge that I wanted to do, I wanted to program a complete shoot 'em up game for the Commodore 64, actually release it on cartridge uh, as well as floppy disk so it works on the original machine and, and everything like that and on all the emulators. So. So I did that in between. Then we started Amiga uh, Alive and Kicking. Um, now Amiga Alive and Kicking became more of a passion project because of course 2020 was, was the year that the world stopped for a bit. And to be honest, things haven't got much better since, have they? Because it's like, you know, if it's not one thing, it's another thing going on. 
But the one thing, um, just to round things up now, that I want to say, it's the same thing that I said at the beginning, right? The one thing that comes through with, with what we did with the meter alignment and kicking is that um, it is all about the community, you know? Um, it, it was said just at the beginning of the documentary there that, that the community, when the going got tough, Right? We didn't all get going and disappear. We, 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 we sort of came together online and then people like dusted off their, their old uh, Amigas and they started, all oh, right, what can I do? How can I upgrade it? What can I do to make it better? And somebody once told me a story about, um, you know, talk about retro computers, it's a bit like classic cars. Like some people, they like to have a classic car and they like it to be exactly the, the classic car that it should have been in the first place. And if they get any new parts for it, they want them to be authentic old parts. They want it to be the classic car. Now, that's great. Nothing wrong with that. Some people, they want to put like new tyres on, new bigger wheels. They want to like lower the suspension. They want to put a bit better engine in. That's great as well. Then some people, they want to buy a brand new replica of the old car. And, you know, that's the way it is now in, in the, uh, the retro world. Um, yeah, it was said, uh, Dave, Dave Amy said, um, these old computers might not be around forever, so it's good that we make new old computers. You know, so even um, the, the purists, the, the guys that created these original machines, they want them to go as long as possible, but they're embracing new technology. So. In the documentary, we actually talk about the FPGA machines, so all the, the they're not emulators, they're actually uh, configured into being them old machines. Um, we've got next generation uh, machines, and we talk to people that, that are using them and, and running them. And then, of course, we've got um, the emulators, you know, the, the Amiga Mini has, has just come out. Some people love it or like it or hate it. It doesn't matter. The, the world is, is getting more open to the Amiga, like, Amiga Bill uh, in the documentary says, like now is possibly one of the best times ever to be an Amiga. And it's like, even better than when Amiga was actually out. Well, maybe, because Amiga at this moment in time seems to be going from strength to strength. So I'm not doing, uh, being an Amiga ambassador, but it's what I see and we take people that I talk to. Uh, and then uh, the other thing that there is, is that all the accelerators and accelerators, that's like putting the new engine in the retro car, uh, in the classic car, should I say. <laughs> and there's so many different, uh, you know, we've got the Vampire, of course we've got the uh, Vampire standalone, which that's following on the, the, the chipset, you know, rather than um, an FPGA, but we've got all these devices, and, um, and what, that's what we wanted to capture, this, this next moment in time, on how people are using Amiga right now, and coming to events like this. Um, but whilst we did do the, the uh, Amiga Alive and Kicking, we did look at Commodore as well, because we wanted to cover what the new thing's happening in Commodore. Um, so the, the Mega 65 is a new version of the Commodore 64. Um, we also have a retro revival, like a small documentary in, in there. We actually interviewed the Oliver Twins, so we've got one of the uh, Oliver Twins. It's Andrew, does it? Yeah. No. He's got paid. Andrew, right. It's not Andrew, it's Philip that's here, yeah. right. Um, I didn't want to ask him, are you Andrew or Philip? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so Philip's here too, so we, we actually interviewed um, the Oliver Twins and that, that was great for the Retro Revival. And we talked we talk, uh, to the guys that make the Spectrum next. Um, you know, so, so for me, it's all embracing, you know. So if there's one thing that I want you to remember today, is it's all about us and what we can bring to the community and what we're doing and um, yeah just wanted to give you the background what we've been up to and um, and the little easter egg that i want to to give you like just now is that if i if i was to rewind um this um right okay so this is this is a little easter egg and this is a little glimpse of what could be happening. So there on screen you see Cosmic Force Reloaded and um, Cosmic Force was the, for the 64 and um, that's a little Easter egg and, it, and at one point it's like do I really want to put myself through this torture again? 
And the answer is yes. And it was torture, like doing Cosmic Force for the 64. It took about 18 months. But I feel like I want to carry on and do full circle games for the VIC-20, games for the 64, uh, and, and now games for the Amiga. So you, you'll hear a little bit more about this. And, you know, I'm, I think I'm going to do a lot of work on it before even announcing anything. Um, but now it's a little bit of an Easter egg. So I have announced a little bit. So it's not top secret, but, um, but yeah, I think my journey is going to continue because mainly my background is a developer and I want to carry on developing. And, and, and your job, maybe like you're, you're into developing or hardware or any ideas that you bring to your clubs or whatever, it's, it's all, we're all part of the same family and that's the, the retro family. And I think that's, that's it from me. I probably went over time, I don't know how long I was supposed to talk. Can we go for another hour? Yeah. <laughs> no. Next one's that's for half one. So. Yeah, yeah. No. I, I want to say thank you very much for, for listening, and, and I will I will open it up for some questions if anyone's got any questions. So. No, that's all right. No. <laughs> no, no. Seriously, any questions? If, if there's any questions, but um, it's been a pleasure talking to you, and, and thanks for for, for listening. Um, and uh, you know, I, I'm always interested. You see, like what what you guys have been up to, you know. And uh, during lockdown, what you guys have been up to? So I'll be downstairs, you know. Like, please come and talk to us, and, and you know, looking around, I've seen lots of familiar faces. Anyway, I've talked to you loads of you before, you know. So, but um, it's always a pleasure, and uh, thank you very much.